another one. It's a big one. It's a big one. <coughs> it's so big, there's a three-slide introduction. So, could we have the first one? So, it's a, it's a modest scope this morning. We're just going to talk about God, the universe, and in fact, everything. So, it's a, it's a, little, bit, it's a little bit dense. However, the person who started it is Kev. Is, is Kev here? This, this is all, all your fault. If we could just go on the next one. So, um, after Kev's talk, there are people who listen in, in Eastern Europe, and that's what happened to one of them. <laughs> if you don't understand that, you'll have to listen to the talk. But all I'm doing is trying to take some of the big thoughts that Kev brought and see if I can add any other perspectives to them. But, next slide please. This is a talk without that many footholds or handholds from a theological perspective. And I'm wearing this t-shirt so you don't forget. This is from the Red Goat Climbing Wall, which is near where we live in York. And uh, that's what that is. And so every time you look at me, please remember everything I'm saying, there's not a lot to hold on to. And, and you, should, you should treat it and contextualize it in exactly that way, okay? It's a bit, it's a bit of a punt. Um, oh, just the last thing. As a result, for those of you who've heard me before, I have an opinion warning. This whole talk needs an opinion warning, okay? The whole thing is, is my take on a bunch of these topics. Other opinions are available. All right, let's have the first clip. I'm not sure if it, if it was those worms, but I dreamt last night of being attacked by giant snakes. <laughs> I'd have uh, configured a special prayer meeting once upon a time, but... I think, I, think it was, I think it was just cheese, to be honest. <clears throat> so, we used to believe in a clockwork universe. Could we have the slide? There we go. This was Newton's theory of gravity. Many of us who are old were taught this at school. And in this world, the universe is mechanistic, it's materialistic, and it's closed. The only way any kind of God could intervene is to push or pull matter, a bit like a giant cosmic snooker player. And unsurprisingly, many people claimed that the universe was all there was. There isn't really a lot of room for God in the clockwork universe. But then something happened. If we could have the next slide. Quantum physics happened. And the last time I was here, I made a joke saying, oh, I'm going to try and explain quantum physics. And then we all had a bit of a laugh about it. And this morning, I'm going to try and explain quantum physics. <laughs> A tiny, tiny bit of it. So, now we know that the universe is made up of matter, yes, tiny particles, electrons, neutrons, all the things we already knew about. But we also know that quantum particles exhibit something called particle wave duality. Don't worry. Don't worry. What that means is sometimes the quantum particle is physical, but sometimes it's a wave, and a wave is not physical. A wave is a mathematical abstraction. It's actually more like a thought than a thing. Hilariously, I think, maybe I should get out more, J.J. Thompson 
won the Nobel Prize in 1906 for his discovery that electrons are particles. And then his son, George, won the Nobel Prize in 1937 for showing that they're actually waves. They were both right, but I imagine there were some interesting family discussions. So particles are the smallest building blocks of the universe sometimes. But then they flip into this wave state where they are not physical at all. And in fact, I'll talk a bit more like this, they're like an abstraction of themselves. And if you don't understand that, you're in very good company, including me, including most scientists, as it turned out. Weirdly, it's quite like Plato's philosophy, which I touched on last time if you were here. There's an essence of a thing, which is its idea, and then there's a particular instance of it. Quantum physics is a bit like that. You've got the particle, and then it flips into a waveform where it's more like the idea of a particle. Now, this is so revolutionary and counterintuitive, particularly because no one can predict where, when, or how the particle state is coming. That means we don't have a clockwork universe. We have a universe that's completely open to change and isn't just physical. This is so weird that Einstein thought it was wrong. However, three scientists, Aspect, Clauser, and Zillinger, finally proved Einstein wrong, winning the 2022 Nobel Prize. By the way, if you ever realize you're wrong, take some comfort from the fact that Einstein was wrong. It's actually okay. What's more, some people think, and I don't mean crackpots, I mean scientists, as I'll come on to explain, think that if you add up all of the wave states of all the particles of a universe, it actually looks suspiciously like a mind. George Wald, who's a former Harvard professor and also a Nobel Prize winner. How many talks have had this many Nobel Prize winners in, in the first six minutes? You see, even if it's nonsense, you've got value in a way. George Wald said this. He, he published an essay in 1984 called Life and Mind in the Universe, saying... It's occurred to me lately, I must confess with some shock at first to my scientific sensibilities that mind has existed always as the matrix, the source and condition of physical reality. The stuff of which physical reality is composed is mind stuff. This isn't a New Age guru. This isn't a Christian theologian or philosopher. This is a Harvard professor of biology. And then, two Italian scientists investigated similarities between the neural networks of the brain and the cosmic network of the galaxies, and this is how they concluded. It's occurred to me lately, oh, no, I've already read that. See, I put my glasses on and then I can't, I can't, see, I can't see anything. <laughs> the tantalizing degree of similarity that our analysis exposes seems to suggest that the self-organization of both complex systems, that's the brain and the universe, 
is likely being shaped by similar principles. And if that's a bit dense, the independent newspaper explained it, the universe is like a giant human brain. As a consequence, something is coming to existence called panpsychism, which I think is a good name for a band, actually, but um, nonetheless, it's a discipline that has effectively collapsed the distinction between mind and matter, suggesting that they're two sides of the same thing. And Christian pan, panpsychists, oh yeah, um, have actually reimagined creation in that way. Scientist, theologian, and mystic, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, by the way, he's French, <laughs> summarized things well when he described matter and spirit as a dynamic unity of two elements in an intimate relationship with each other. In his view, each infused with the divine. What does this tell us? Well, it could tell us from a Christian humanist perspective on that uh, four box model if you were here for it. It could tell us that scientists have found the Christ-soaked universe that we've been talking about. And maybe God was always living right on top of us, just like the, uh, the clip. But also within us and everything around us. Don't worry if this is not immediately obvious <laughs> as to what this is and what it means, but I'll come back and try and summarize it in really simple terms at the end for my own benefit, if not yours. But there's been a bit of rethinking as a consequence of this as to what God might be. If we could just have the next slide. Traditional theism, that's basically what most of us who have a religious background um, have been taught about God. Believe that God and creation are separate, and God is, there's a whole string of quite big words, God is transcendent, immutable, impassable, and timeless. Now, the problem is that has got more to do with Greek philosophy than anything the Bible says. If you read the Bible, you do not see a God that's any of those things. You see a God very dynamically involved with creation. And actually, these discoveries in science are causing a bit of a rethink. Most people will probably have heard of pantheism, which is when the universe is God and they're the same thing. That's prevalent in a lot of Eastern religion. But the thing that's emerged out of all this quantum thinking is something called panentheism, God in everything, or everything in God. What that means is that somehow the universe is contained in God. Now, there's a bunch of problems here, theological problems. Um, and, and lots of other problems. If the universe is part of God, when was it created? Because God wasn't created, so there's a problem. And why is there so much pain and suffering in a universe that's apparently contained within God? And just as a signal forward, that subject's so big and so problematic to everything else that I'm going to say this morning, I'm going to come back to it the next time I'm here, even though I don't want to. <laughs> Something's emerged called relational theism that's a bit of a cross between the two ends, and it suggests that God somehow made a space for creation. So God's infinite, but he sometimes makes 
a space for something, and that is creation. What does any of this mean? I think it means, for our purposes, and on the Kev trail, what I think it means is that thinking of the universe as a closed physical system is a mode of thinking that's not only not theologically useful, it's not scientifically valid anymore. And the universe is a far more open thing where it's quite possible. It's quite possible and very easy, actually, to imagine God either existing in the mind of the universe or connecting to the universe through the wave side, the thought side of matter. We should think about a universe then that's wide open to God, but also wide open maybe to us. By the way, if you've got through this section, the worst is over. I promise you, it gets a bit, it gets a bit easier from here. But could we have the second clip, please? Just to explain this film slightly, he is an eye specialist, um, not the kind of, of, of eye specialist that my dad used to refer to, which was people who talk endlessly about themselves. Uh, but he's a, he's a proper eye specialist, and he, he met someone, I don't want to spoil the film, but he, he met someone who was the person he was talking to, and he photographed eyes, and he photographed her eyes, and he's just seen them on that billboard because he is trying to find her. Lucky 11s. So he's following this strange path of synchronicity and eventually he finds her eyes. And we hear a bit more about it later in the next clip. Can we have the next slide, please? So, back to some of the ideas that Kev was talking about. Neville Goddard is the um, founder, really, of this whole idea of manifestation. Uh, the law of attraction or the law of assumption. That's what that is. And it's predicated on a few principles, which I'll summarize. Firstly, imagination creates reality. Which sounds crazy, except it sounds a bit like quantum mechanics. And the law of assumption, which assumes that a desire has already been fulfilled and will lead to a manifestation in physical reality, which sounds crazy, except that Jesus said something almost exactly the same. Allegorical, non-literal interpretations of biblical texts, which sounds crazy, except that the whole ancient school of Alexandria, one of the two big theological schools of early Christianity, thought exactly the same. And finally, self-identification with God, which just sounds crazy, except that it's exactly the same as the Eastern Orthodox idea of deification. So, it all sounds a bit crazy, and yet it's all got some kind of precedent somewhere in orthodox faith or in science. What about cosmic ordering? Well, cosmic ordering is almost the same, except there's no God or religion in it. Um, so the central idea is that individuals make requests or orders of the universe for anything that they desire, and the universe responds by fulfilling their requests. It, it was founded by someone called Babel. Uh, there's some really hard words to pronounce. <laughs> moor, I'm saying it. I'm saying it a bit like a Yorkshire moor. Um, um, but that's not important. What's important is it's endorsed by Noel Edmonds. <laughs> yeah. So that's made you think again, hasn't it? Uh, but then there's a version of this which is actually Christianized. 
It's the old name it and claim it movement. I was very influenced by that in my sort of late teens, early 20s. Kenneth Hagen is a good example of that. Some of you might have read Kenneth Hagen's books. Who says that faith is a, faith is a force, it's a tangible force, a spiritual substance that believers can use to shape their world. It brings health, wealth, and other blessings. Words spoken in faith have creative and transformative power. Positive confession means that believers have authority to speak things into existence, and positive statements of faith, according to Hagen, lead to positive outcomes. So, irrespective of their religious context, these three things have a lot of factors in common. They revolve around imagining, speaking, believing, and receiving things. In all cases, God or the universe, and we've just seen that maybe we're not quite sure what the difference is as much as we did, God or the universe fulfills your request. So how do we explain this? Well, there's a bunch of options, and they're not mutually exclusive. And can we have the first slide? This is my favorite slide of, of the pack. Um, maybe it's all just a load of hokum. Maybe it's a deliberate deception, it's knowingly fake, and it's designed to make the founders of these ideas rich and famous. If you can't read this, this is apparently a Muppet scream. They've made a Muppet scream into a bag, and it says, smell its fear, absorb its power. Of course, it's a bag of air, but, but you can buy it if you want. It's a real thing in a shop. And I think in support of the fakeness of some of these ideas, Goddard died at 67 of an aneurysm. Moore experienced burnout and then died of cancer at 46. Hagen lived to 86, but he had four major heart um, episodes uh, before the one that killed him. And someone called D.R. McConnell has written a scathing critique of the whole word of faith movement, tracing it back to Christian science and, and basically calling into question the integrity of its spokespeople. And I have no doubt in my mind that there's a fair dose of willful, fake deception in these schemes. But... I don't believe that that explains the whole of what we're seeing. Maybe we could have the next slide. This isn't much better. This is self-deception. When I did the talk on faith without religion, the Elvis talk for anyone who was here, I sunk deep into postmodern theology and, and one of the lasting things that came out of that for me is just how prone human beings are to self-deception. So do we see correlation where there's no causation? Do we see patterns of things where actually one doesn't cause the other and we fool ourselves? We're actually told in Goddard's uh, system it's called the law of selective attention. You only look at the things that are affirming what it is you're trying to um, achieve, which means you screen out all the contra data. And I don't know if any of you have seen it. I should have brought it. There's a thing where you're looking. There's people bouncing a ball between themselves, and you're supposed to count the number of bounces. And... A person in a gorilla suit walks through them, and I kid you not, you do not see that person until it's pointed out to you because your attention is elsewhere. So is this just selective attention and wishful thinking? I think there's some of that in all of this as well, but I still don't believe 
that even these two things together explain the whole of what's going on. What about the positive spin on this? Maybe being a bit more positive, having some goals and focusing on them actually makes it much more likely that, that you achieve them. There's nothing spiritual in that or nothing requiring divine intervention anyway, but unsurprising that if you set some objectives and then you focus on them, that perhaps more of them come true. You could call that positive programming, you know, to pick up on one of Kev's themes. But there are other options. There are spiritual, spiritual options. Could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Maybe something is going on here that's supernatural and it is enabled by something other than God. This is a massive controver controversial subject. I'm not entirely sure what I think about it, just to be very clear. But what I don't think is likely in these cases um, that it's possible to argue that the devil gave me a Snickers. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a plausible explanation for what's going on. So for now, I'm moving that whole thing to one side. Maybe we'll come back to that if I survive the suffering talk. But maybe, and I think there might be something in this, maybe there's spiritual principles and laws encoded in the universe itself. What if this collective mind of the universe contains logic? And given that this mind of the universe is just the flip side of matter, could it be that physical things happen as a result of thoughts? Given that we are part of that mind and matter, if we think things, do we influence the mind and matter around us in some way? Is this the basis of many of these ancient religions that seem to try and harness nature in some way? I mean, that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Personally, I think that is an open question that is distinctly plausible. And I'm going to take it to the next step in just a minute after the final clip. Don't watch that film with your kids, by the way. <laughs> so, thanks for coming and giving us some incomprehensible science followed by a load of New Age nonsense. Uh, we look forward to your next visit. What if you were now to imagine all of this in a more overtly Christian context? Let me just read some scripture. You weren't expecting that, were you? Just listen to these scriptures with a sort of open mind to what we've just been talking about. What I'm going to do is put my glasses on. Psalm 139. Where could I go to escape from your spirit or from your sight? If I were to climb up to the highest heavens, you would be there. And if I were to dig down to the world of the dead, you'd also be there. Proverbs 8, 22 to 31. This boggles my mind. This is all about wisdom, and wisdom is personified in a female form for the purposes of, of this uh, section. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work 
the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had even been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Some strange pre-existing wisdom about something from somewhere. But then John 1, 1 to 4, maybe tells us a bit more about what that is or who that is. In the beginning was the one who is called the Word, and the Word was with God and was truly God from the very beginning. The Word was with God. And with this Word, God created all things. Nothing was made without the Word. Everything that was created received its life from him, and his life gave light to everything. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. And finally, Colossians 1, 16 to 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Can we just have the, the next slide, please? Thank you. That's quantum Jesus. <clears throat> it's quite possible, and not really in my mind, all that much of a leap, if we have this mind of the universe, if we have this abstract form in which it exists as well as its physical form, it's actually not that difficult to understand that there might be this wisdom, this thought, this principle of order mentioned in Proverbs but more fully explained as being the pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus is interconnected with creation all the time. And this is, I think, where we get the Christ-soaked universe from. It's just that we didn't have the physics when that originated. So what would that mean? Just go with me. You might say, I'm already, I'm already not there. Just go with me as a thought experiment. Let's say that's the case. What if, what if God is somehow a part of Every particle of matter in our universe, including every particle of us. Could it be that when we make these requests, it's like some kind of prayer, even though we're not trying to pray? What if God has encoded the idea of providing daily bread into the universe itself? Karl Rayner, who's probably the most important Catholic theologian of the 20th century, said, once Jesus brought grace into the world, it can be mediated and distributed through many religious and non-religious systems. Could this be hinted at in the Bible? Remember the T-shirt. Take this for what it is. Little tiny hand and footholds. Firstly, the indiscriminate generosity of God, Matthew 5. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. There's a number of things like that where God provides what's called theologically general grace to everybody. Intriguingly and weirdly, and something that you probably wouldn't make up if you were trying to sell the story of Jesus, in Mark 9, unbelievers are casting out demons using, because they've seen, they've seen Jesus do it, and the disciples, and they're casting out demons in Jesus' name, even though they're not following Jesus. 
doesn't matter what the actual setting is here. But there really seems to be a sense in which even if you don't believe you can invoke some spiritual principles in Jesus' name, and they work, Jesus says, don't stop them. Don't stop them. It's really weird. Could it be that anyone who collaborates with God's purposes, consciously or unconsciously, can get an outcome? And then, just the weirdest of all to finish off, 1 Corinthians 10 says, They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Basically, Paul is writing about the Exodus experience where the Israelites were being given water from a rock. And Paul says, Oh, the rock was Christ. Did I mention that? What on earth does that mean? I think it could mean, among many things, that somehow Jesus, pre-existent, incarnate, and now ascended, is somehow the source of things in our world, even, then we, even when we don't know. A source of good things that somehow Jesus was behind even the provision of water in the desert before he ever came to earth. This isn't much to go on. But maybe, maybe a, a gracious God has built that very grace into the universe and the when we try and manifest things or make a cosmic order or name it and claim it, if it's somehow aligned to God's purposes in the universe, whether we're really asking God or not, he could bring it about. I think it's possible. I think it's possible that some of these things are a weak or unconscious form of prayer. Now, if this was true, we would probably expect to see a really well-developed version of this in Christian history, which we do. 2,000 years of mystical inner Christianity has existed, and we somehow blot it out. Paul casually mentions in, in one of the letters, he was taken up to the third heaven. And we probably read that in church, and Paul was taken up to the third heaven. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? The whole of the book of Revelation is a vision. All of it. But then outside the Bible, we've got the desert fathers, we have Mount Athos, uh, a source of mystical Christianity in the East, where Prince Charles has been. I, I feel sure that Noel Edmonds will be going soon. Julian of Norwich, could we have the next slide, please? Julian of Norwich, any idea where she was from? Yeah, not that far away had a vision, she had a lot of visions, and she's very much in vogue, apparently, in circles where someone like that could be in vogue. And she had a vision of the universe. And she reports that God said to her, it exists because I love it. Which is a little bit close to some of what we've been talking about, but just a very, very long time ago. And maybe it's not a coincidence that all other religions also have a mystical branch. Islam has Sufism. Judaism has Kabbalah. 
There's Zen Buddhism and Hinduism that are intrinsically mystical. Are they all wrong? Or have we been praying in the clockwork universe? I've heard so much talk about like separation from God. That's the clockwork universe where God's somehow out there and we're locked in this mechanism. What if God instead is actually part of every single particle that makes you? I'll come back to that in a minute. You can probably tell my head's blown off. Uh, <laughs> um, but it has. Maybe there's an inner world of spiritual reality which we now have even started to find in science that explains why things happen in ways that are surprising and look like someone is behind them. In him we live and move and have our being. Could we just have the next slide, please? I had to finish with a ladder, really. This is Jacob's ladder. And Jacob has a dream in the Old Testament where he sees angels going up and down between heaven and earth all the time. And Jacob's ladder is a symbol of the closeness of heaven and earth. And it could just be, it could just be that heaven and earth are so close that they come together in every particle of existence in a way that means separation from God is a crazy thought. That prayer isn't some weird appeal to something or someone out there. It's a recognition that every atom Sorry, atoms are out of fashion. Every quantum particle that makes us up is infused with the divine. I actually did an experiment just praying, and instead of praying in that conventional way, just allowing myself to imagine that every part of me and everything I could see around me was infused with God. And it was just effortless. I really enjoyed it. Because all this terrible angst that we've had to try and reach God might all have been completely in vain, completely in the wrong paradigm that we now find not only because it was always there in the Bible, if, if, we, if we managed to read it, but now in science. So, maybe God was on top of us and all around us all the time, and we just didn't know, and it took physics. It took physics to wake us up to be able to open our mind to it in a new way and maybe that means that the universe is also open and maybe that means that many things can happen that are exciting, creative and unexpected in our lives and around us. And of course that very possibility brings to really sharp focus what I mentioned before that if that's true what kind of God provides a Snickers bar and leaves children to die of cancer in hospital. We have to return to that question. I know it's personal for many of you, it's personal to me. We have to return to that question because it's tantalizingly wonderful, this whole thing, but that is the biggest fly in the ointment, philosophically and theologically, that you could imagine. And I've no idea what I'm going to say when I come back in four weeks' time. I've started, I've, started, I've started looking at it too, and I still have no idea. No idea. Maybe there isn't an answer. But we have to look for an answer. But in the meantime, I just encourage you. You'll do whatever you want. That's the whole point of Q. But I just encourage you to stop imagining 
the universe as a closed and clockwork system and something dynamic, creative, and maybe wonderfully open to the divine. Thank you.